Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Underserved, the podcast for the rest of the tech industry. I'm your host, Andrew Jelina. Our guest this week is Arvind Singh, a senior software engineer who specializes in security and identity management. Welcome, Arvind. Hi, how are you? All right. Thank you for coming down today. So a question I often ask folks is, what got you excited about computers? How did you kind of get started with programming and technology? I got introduced to computers when I was 16, I think. It's around 86, 85, 86. And uh, we were one of the lucky federal schools who got BBC Micros come in to our school. And I got hand. I just, we loved it. Mm -hmm. It was, nobody has seen computers before. (laughs) In India, it's... (laughs) Love at first sight? Yes. (laughs) And we were lucky enough to have full access to it. So that's how it started writing simple games and basic and and they offered additional classes too and um it's funny um indian schools engineering schools didn't have computer science or computer engineering hmm. 86 87 was the first year when they started offering the course and i was lucky 88 out of school high school and i went for computer engineering four years no oh, they got it ready just in time for you oh yeah <laughs> it was a lot of fun <laughs> A lot of fun. Um, so we had a uh, mainframe donated by Cummins to our school. And we had a little apples. Like Apple twos. Yeah, Apple twos. Yep. And uh, we had a Unix system too, uh, SVR5, with full AT&T license. Oh, wow. So you have to take times, which is shared time with terminals, VT100 terminal. So I got I to gotta ask you, VI or Emacs? I'm VI. All right. I'll tell you why. There's a story behind it. Okay. I use VI. <laughs> yeah. Like Vim or? I use VI, VI, pure hardcore. <laughs> uh, there's a story behind it. So old school C compilers and my internship and finally it was compilers. That two functional languages, which are big now mm-hmm. after almost 30 years. <laughs> what, what's old is new again. Yeah. And the problem was I did that for a couple of years with a professor out of University of Pune and no jobs. <laughs> oh. <laughs> with a compiler, you have to know COBOL <laughs> or some kind of C. Yeah. There were no jobs in it yet, period. Mm-hmm. It opened up after a couple of years. Mm-hmm. So we had this SVR system. Everything is expensive. Somebody is copying the books. Books are expensive. Everything is expensive. And then suddenly GNU came along. Mm-hmm. Actually, before GNU, free BSD, BSD came along, mm-hmm. which was really, really free. And that's how I learned my own stuff. And Minix was there. Mm-hmm. Now you, see, you have BSD. Then GCC came along. Mm-hmm. We were like, whoa, this is cool. <laughs> but Still, we learned ourselves, but still there were no jobs. So I ended up fixing um, Xerox machines, copiers, and uh, fax machines. Mm -hmm. So that was probably a year after um, laser printers Mm -hmm. printers came along, the HP laser printers, you know. So that's what I did for work, um, programming CNC machines, (laughs) whoever wanted it. And um, I worked with Lax for comments a little bit too. Uh, and then suddenly everything opened up and I worked in um, uh, one of the first venture-backed startups in India, which is a huge company now. It's called Master in Pune. And I was lucky enough and I was in uh, R&D there. Mm-hmm. Full Unix shop, all version, right from HP UX, SEO, you name it, AIX. I worked with R6000 too. It was good fun, good team, good people. And hacked away the so whole thing. How'd you become a VI guy? Okay, so well, BSD is the real open source, you know, which is free as beer, mm-hmm. you know. And it is, if you are in India, and not just in India, even here, you are on a modem, slowest as hell. Mm-hmm. Even now, two years ago, before both, I used to work um, for a DDoS. Uh, company making devices for DDoS uh, mitigation out of Hudson, you know, you still have to connect to switches. Mm -hmm. You still have to connect to these devices. And the fastest thing is VI. Mm -hmm. There's no Emacs. (laughs) It's 
fast, a simple text. And, and it's the lowest common denominator. You can almost always count. If it has a VT100 terminal, it has VI. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, and I love Bill Joy. Bill Joy created VI. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I love the story because they fought at and Yeah. And they fought it and they, they won. Mm -hmm. It was, they wrote everything. And it's, they're running the internet now. FreeBSD is huge. Mm -hmm. It's hidden somewhere, but it's there everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a bit about uh, the open source underpinnings that that kind of power the whole Internet. So a lot of folks don't know, like how the Linux boom and the FreeBSD boom right. and Apache right. boom right. really contributed to that. Right. So the BSD was the first one that then was good. Um, and very few people know that uh, don't know that Windows has the strongest TCP stack and it comes from BSD. The only problem with the BSD was since it's free as a beer, everybody took it. Mm -hmm. Nobody gave back anything. Mm -hmm. And around that time in Mastic, I joined FSF, you know, um, and I never knew that I'll end up in Cambridge <laughs> at that time <laughs> and I'll go to their office. <laughs> yeah, that's like, that's like Mecca. Yes. And GCC, I'm grateful to GCC for my career um, because it came along at the right time and it taught me everything, and I'm grateful for FreeBSD to teaching me everything about OS, mm. literally. Like, so for people who don't know a lot about open source, there was a movement that's it's been around for a long time, but it got very big in the late 90s to produce software that, as Arvin said, was free as in beer, as in you could get it without paying, but also free as in speech, in that you could kind of do what you wanted with it. You know, prior to that, a lot of folks, when you would distribute software, you'd get a binary. If you've been on a Windows platform, you have sure you've seen an installer that ends in .exe, and that puts a program and some DLLs on your computer in order to run. Or in uh, Unix, there's the idea of executable files. In Macs, you have the DMG files that you install in order to get your binaries, and that's compiled computer code that uh, runs on there. But in order to make that, software developers write source code. And in a lot of companies, that's kind of kept in a vault as a locked away secret. But with the idea of open source was not only will we give away the binaries, we'll also give away the source code and make it so that you can extend it, change it, fix bugs in it, contribute those changes back to the open source project and everyone can benefit from it. Um, that was really big. I know with network drivers, yes. um, that was one of the big yeah. things that everyone was doing in the late 90s yeah. to try and make it so that all these Linux and Unix computers could talk to one another. My code is BSD, which is free. I write code, I give it back. But GNU has a different, a little different take on open source because mm -hmm. you have to give it back mm -hmm. because they have the GPL license. So everybody's forced if you're using it. And if you change it, you have to give it back to the community. I like it. And that's how Linux is. And it is still GPL2, V2. <laughs> he didn't even go to V3. And that's an interesting take on open source, giving it back. Um, the third kind of open source now is VC. They have their own licenses. MIT license is one. Mm -hmm. Google has its own licensing for Golang or other software. Microsoft also has. It's open source. It's free. But they have control it. Python has its own license. The problem with that is the control. Somebody is controlling it. Languages like Java that Oracle control it. They just gave it away. But it's a huge issue. It's a free work from all the de free developers all over the world. There's contention. What I don't like about it is they're controlling it. They change it. Mm. I don't have any say in it. It's not like that in GCC. You know, if I change it, if somebody changes it, gives it back, that's what people like me who do C and C++, they are ANSI certified. And none of other languages are ANSI. They don't like to have give it to ANSI. Then it becomes really open. Mm -hmm. Anybody can use C. It's, it's, it's the only Turing complete language. You can do anything with it. <laughs> mm. And C++, and here, here are the standards. It's a standard language, but you cannot do that with Python or a Golang or C Sharp because it's still controlled by corporates. Mm -hmm. I don't know how far it will go because there will always be problems. 
the major problem is with Java that Oracle just gave to Red Hat and the other group. Otherwise, it's a huge problem. And Oracle is known to do those things. <laughs> they did it with MySQL. They did it with Sleepy Cat BSD. Many other databases too. So there are three different kinds of things running right now in this industry. I would say the GPL FSF is the most, the best way to go forward because if I'm writing code and if somebody's using my code and he wants to change it, he gives it back. So every, everyone benefits from if someone forks or does their own thing, they're kind of eventually giving pull requests back and yes. the person that owns the project can yes. say, yeah, I like your stuff. Let's yeah. incorporate it and exactly. let everyone benefit. Exactly. Not like BSD. Apple has everything. They have not given anything back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Microsoft, but Microsoft is now big in Linux, mm -hmm. but they're giving back a lot, a lot. <laughs> You know, I've we've worked with Microsoft for an awful long time. Well, some of the first projects we did at Syrinx were C Sharp and SQL Server development. And back then, they were definitely still very proprietary. We're doing right. our thing. It's our way or the highway. Right. You live in our ecosystem. You use our IDE. Right. You use our tools. And it didn't really play that well right. with... Uh, they realized it. Yeah. I, and, uh, now they're committing back to Linux like crazy. Yeah. They're the largest computer. One of the, Intel, same with Intel, too. I used to have to install the SIGWIN tools everywhere if oh, I wanted yeah. to use <laughs> yeah. Unix stuff I remember that. on uh, on Windows. And now you can have a full-on Ubuntu yes. system running on there yep. that you can get from the Microsoft Store. Right. That, that kind of blows my <laughs> mind. That's a 180-degree change. Oh, yeah. It's a huge change. As, uh, two as 2002, 2003, like I do startups too, a lot of startups. We ha it took me some time to convince uh, investors to invest, but they were like so much of resistance that because we were trying to use Linux and MySQL. Now it's other way. It's, it has just flipped. You know, everybody just by default, it's or some kind of open, you know, it's mostly integration. Everything is there. It is a huge change from 2000, early 2000s to 2019. Mm -hmm. yeah, it has evolved. The idea of making your software popular is to have be open more eyes look at it and they make it better. It's, it's logical. Yep. <laughs> yeah, so that, that is one of the other side benefits of open source, that if you open it up to everyone, you get contributions that can help you with security, yes. that can help you with performance, that can help you with functionality. You kind of get a hive working on something to make it better. You're kind of crowdsourcing the right. development, if you will. But to touch a little bit more on the licensing, there's a couple things we didn't cover yet. So you mentioned there's a ton of different open right. source licenses. I was reading this morning, there's about 80 approved and popular ones. They generally fall in one of two camps. One is similar to what you were talking about with GNU, with yep. what they call a copy left. Right. So instead of a copyright, you copy left your code. And it's what they call a viral license. Right. So if you write code and it's got this type of license for copy left, and then someone goes and uses it in their company, they actually now have to open source all of their stuff mm -hmm. that touches it yep. um, legally. Legally. And yep. they, they can actually get sued over it. Yes. Then there's another type of license that's more like a permissive license where you can take open source code and incorporate it into closed source offerings. And you right. don't necessarily have to open source all of your software in turn. But you do have to at least give credit where credit is due right. and show it in your about and yes. in your, your files and so forth. Like Evernote, I use when you do in a, you know, help about in there, it tells you all the open source yes. libraries that they're kind of leaning on. But Evernote doesn't in turn open source all of oh, their, yeah. you know, sharding technology and all the stuff that right. they use. There is some debate back and forth, you know, which is better. Obviously, the corporate types like the option of keeping it closed source. Mm -hmm. But as you said, it doesn't tend to then help the op the core open source project if everyone's just forking it and keeping their yes. additions to themselves. Yeah, it hurts. Yeah. There's actually entire companies like Black Duck Software yes. helps you try to figure out how does this licensing work? For me, can I incorporate this in my product? What does it mean to me? Is it permissive or is it right. copy left? And I know me personally, I did a project a long time ago, um, early 2000s. And I went to the client and said, hey, we can use this open source thing. You can either link to it 
and then you may need to open source all your stuff, or there's an executable version we can shell out to, right. and then you don't need to open source your stuff because yeah. <laughs> that's enough of an arm's length. Actually, Richard Stallman has a script too. You can run that script on your code. Okay. I used to use that a lot, a long time ago. <laughs> he, he wrote a script just to be sure, uh, check your licenses, what code is, you know. He has a script. It's still up on his website, I feel Okay. Yeah, I didn't know there was a freely available script yes. to check your licensing. It's, it's just Solomon wrote that, so okay. it's there. Are you in the software consulting industry and sick of posting your resume just to get bombarded by recruiters? They tell you all about opportunities that aren't even in your skill set or even where you can commute to? Looking for a contract role in this market is a full-time job. Let Syrinx do that work for you. This is what Syrinx has specialized in for the last 20 years, both in the Boston market and beyond. Are you a full-time employee that is considering consulting options to have that best of both worlds compensation model? Do you want more remote flexibility? Or do you want to choose that specific tech stack you want to work with? Perhaps you want an increase in pay, but you're stuck in a compensation freeze at your current job? Or maybe you just want to be that hired gun that every company needs to share ship products, and scale. You can email us at apply, that's A-P-P-L-Y, at syrinx.com, or call us at 888-5-SYRINX. Spend your time writing code and let us handle your job search. Contact us today at syrinx.com. So rewinding to uh, your career, so you were working at a paper mill in Pune yep. doing uh, CNC work. Yes, <laughs> programming CNC machines, uh, fixing uh, copiers, um, and then joined Mastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, through Mastic, I worked actually IBM um, Research Lab. There's only two extensions of, uh, I, there are two extensions of um, uh, IBM's Research Lab from uh, Austin, Texas. Uh, it was RS6000 lab that time. They were doing Deep Blue, the guy, uh, the chess machine uh, that was based on EX and RS6000. So they have two um, locations outside US. One is in uh, Bangalore. The other one is Sao Paulo, Brazil. So I worked through mass tech there with RS6000, the guys from here. And then the boom came in India. Everything opened up and my first project was in Germany. So I went to Freiburg. <laughs> Sprecher Sie Deutsch? <laughs> I used to. I lived there many years. <laughs> I worked with these guys, from a couple of professors from um, University of Freiburg. Mm. Um, I lived um, in Fillingen and uh, Stuttgart. I lived there, came back to India, and came to U.S. If you were in Stuttgart, you must be a Porsche fan. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I went back to India and uh, somebody from Cambridge, um, there was a company called iTube many years ago. They called me and uh, they talked to me on the phone. It was out of blue. I don't know. And they had, a, uh, they were looking for people worldwide programmers. So they had a team go India, Brazil, Slovenia. So uh, taking tasks and it seems the HR lady called and she says, oh, you want to come over for a week for interviews here? I said, I'm not sure I want to go to U.S. I'm not ready. I was really young. She said, you were number two programmer from all over <laughs> the world. You should come. <laughs> so I came over, said yes, came back up six months, six or seven months, and we just stayed in Cambridge. I had my own startup. I sold two of them, my own, uh, one out of San Francisco. And one when my daughter was born, 2008, out of Pune. I traveled. I came here and they said, oh, you were in Germany. Go back to Germany. And then I worked for Benz through, as a consulting. This is the first time I was doing consulting. So um, that's the only time I did consulting uh, for three years. Um, it was not really consulting. It was just big projects, fixed price projects. Mm-hmm. Went back to Germany, lived in Germany. Worked for Nokia and Helsinki a little bit. They got me going everywhere, literally throughout all over Europe. Came back, bad times came. That was the first downturn. And then started with a startup called Improvata. They're still there out of Lexington. These guys were uh, offshoot of Polaroid. So they had a little tech for 
fingerprints and, you know, single sign. So they use fingerprints and iris, you know, uh, imaging for... Um, single sign-on? Single sign-on. I've heard the problem there is if someone ever does copy your fingerprint or your or your yeah. your so, retina pattern, you can't exactly change your password yeah. with that one. <laughs> they, they, they were not doing well when they started. But suddenly they found their niche in healthcare, especially the doctors, surgeons. You know, they come in uh, and they have gloves, everything on, and they just stand in front. Uh, they just go in. So they don't have to re-scrub because they can just scan their exactly. eyes. Exactly. And, then and, that... and the nurses too. Okay. You know, so uh, it was pretty cool. And they're pretty big now in healthcare. And provider is really big. Um, they're public now too. A lot of companies... You're tempted when you start a company, like, I want to boil the ocean. I want, yes. you know, to do this for everyone and I'll solve all these problems. And they end up becoming successful because they nail a niche like yes. that. Like Just I, one, yeah. One thing, do it really well and then worry about the other stuff. Yes. So that was the start of my startup early 2000. I had mine before that, that mm -hmm. I sold. I think there's almost like a rapid learning buzz that many of us are addicted to. Yes. Uh, in the software industry. Like I... I like to learn new things. And when there's some project that's tangible and I say, hey, I, I can do that. And I like podcasting. I, right. Like, hey, I can figure this out. I'll figure out how to record it, how to edit it, how to do this, get the plugins, get good at it. Learning things is something that I see a lot of developers, if they're not doing it in work, then they have to be doing it outside. Ideally, they're doing it in both. And that's what they really love. Yes. So I'm involved with um, two robotics teams, too, out of high school, Shrewsbury and Westboro. Both the mentors are very close friends of mine. And I donated a lot of stuff, too, from my basement. Like, they need laptops, soldering, because I worked with them with the stuff anyway. So whatever was left, take it. Now, man cannot live on bits and bytes alone. So what do you do for fun that's not? consulting i think you said you restored bicycles oh I, I i have seven of them so i was i never had a car till my daughter was born my wife had a car she drove me around everywhere <laughs> because i literally grew up in cambridge so i biked everywhere and walked i was part of mass bike coalition too and now i'm not because i have i don't have much time i'm mostly with the kid and um, but we pushed for bike ways all over Massachusetts, and it's looking good now. It's been work of last um, 15 years. We started pushing it. Uh, There's a lot here, and I've seen kind of a movement to uh, have the bikeways connected across different towns and yes. states, so you yes. can go all the way to Atlanta or something yes. like so that. The other one, we has, uh, the work has started connecting Waltham with Worcester. So um, that work has started too. So that'll be very interesting. We pushed, pushed. We went town by town because People in New England are a little different. <laughs> Topsfield was really tough, and we got it. And now all their fears are gone. Everybody wants it. Well, what would people be afraid of with a bike? Oh, my pro yeah, my property prices will go down. Why? Bad elements will come. I no <laughs> what, do they think there's biker gangs yeah. that are going to come riding uh, down, the yeah. pedaling down the train? And I live next to Minutemen in Arlington. I love it. Like, it's beautiful. But we one town we couldn't Sudbury. That Sudbury's anti bike, huh? Surprising. <laughs> I would I would think like Lincoln, Sudbury, Acton, Boxborough, Concord. Yeah. Acton has it. Acton yeah. is okay. Uh, Sudbury is the only town. Uh, so yeah, it was interesting. But now I'm working on a bike from 1974. It's a Univega. So I go sometimes. Or somebody gives me um, yard sales and look for it and uh, build it. And it takes time, whatever time I have, and I give it away. Who do you give them to? There are many f bike enthusiasts here, many in Cambridge and around this area, Greater Boston area. But somebody has to love the bike. You know, people take the bike and it's sitting in the basement. Then there's, there's no point. You have to ride it. Yeah, that's <laughs> the whole point is to ride it. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm working on a 74 Univega. So I think it'll be done by winter, hopefully. Now, I, I see these people riding around on like these four or $5,000 like race yes, bikes. Like, those are, what, what's the difference and is it ever worth it? It's not worth it. Okay. I don't have one. <laughs> Arlington Heights has a quad cycle, so a Turkish guy runs it. And uh, one time I just, I have this old bike and um, I went for a little spare part and he's laughing at my bike. And then he shows me a $4,000 bike. You want to? You should have this. 
I said, and Arlington Heights is all hill. I mm-hmm. said, will it go by itself? <laughs> For four thousand dollars, what's going to? I still have to pedal it. <laughs> yeah. So, so I use my bikes to just go to stores, walk around. Or I do usually. Um, I don't have much time to. But if I bike, I go all the way from Alewife, all the way Bedford to a Concord. Go to Warden Pond. It's like a good twenty, thirty mile loop. So. Um, do you use any of those bike apps like Strava or anything? No, like people do use. No, I don't. No? I'm very old school. <laughs> You're like, and I actually, it took me, when I came here, it took me probably a year to learn how to use gears because in India, we don't have geared bicycles. Oh, really? Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> huh. Now you get it. At least now. <laughs> Pedal it. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have expected that adjustment. Yeah, it takes time. Huh. All right. So. What if I didn't have to pedal the bike? What do you think of all these electric bikes? I would compromise um, because it basically, at least people are looking at bicycles Mm -hmm. rather than driving a car. Mm -hmm. You know, they're still their bicycle. Uh, It stays in winter, still takes stuff (laughs) for people to ride those kind of bikes. But at least it's initiating them to go a little further. Yeah, you know, so that's a good part of it. And pedal some, like you usually have to yes. pedal to get them going, and then they kind of take over from there. Yes, it's like old I've school seen. mopeds. You know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. <laughs> so no, but it's interesting. Uh, it's changing. So we have to take the cars out somehow because this is not good. Boston in the morning is, and it's especially after um, the casino. And I live in Arlington, which is probably three miles from there, two miles, and uh, in the morning you can see people. Just driving out, out of town. It's just, un- and I hope Charlie Baker has already um, ready to sign the bill, which tells like if, if you let your employees work from home, you will get a tax break. So it's on his table. So I don't know when, when he's going to sign it. There's definitely a ton of congestion. You know, every time I have to drive up 93 into Boston and it's still a mess, I'm like, what did we spend billions of dollars on for the big dig? <laughs> like, it's no better. I just went to 7 a.m., 6, 37 a.m. I went to Southie Seaport to drop my buddy off. Like 50 minutes just sitting there on 93. It's crazy. Something has to break. Something has to change. Uh, it's unbearable. I really feel bad for people coming from off west on Mass Pike, coming in. Uh, people coming from Russia all the way to work here. Yeah, there, there's got to be some sort of quantifiable productivity loss in just sitting in traffic as opposed to coming in. But we've seen, actually, we were talking on an earlier episode about how some employers now are having kind of a backlash on remote because there's not enough collaboration right. or overlap. So that's the interesting thing because at both, if you go now, because this year on the CEO said, Work from anywhere. Work from anywhere that is comfortable for you. But uh, it depends on the teams, mm. how you run it too, right? How you want to collaborate. How do you guys collaborate to so stay? Our team, so we are three people. Mm. And we two are very senior. And um, we have a kid from MIT. He's 24. His hours are completely different. He lives in Puerto He's he, And he loves to stay home. Our team has the um, only team that has stand-up, which is online. So... What do you use for that? Is it Hangouts? We, we are on Skype, so... Okay. Yeah, we use Skype because that's a corporate thing. Mm-hmm. We can use Slack, too. Mm-hmm. So we make sure that we do a stand-up. And we make sure once a week we have a collab time. So we are together. Do you do, like, overlapping core hours? Like, everyone has to be on 10 to 4 or anything like no, that? No, we don't do that. Okay. It's three. We are only three, so... Mm-hmm. And we have a lot of code among us we have like 22 services we have the largest number of services and we are critical services we are crypto we are identity we are uh, and every week one guy is on call like this week i'm on call so if it passes up then it comes to me but we like our style and we are pretty close we can share the ide too vs code has i can share it it's different than like screen sharing it's like yeah it's different you can actually yeah you can edit to, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So both of you can collaboratively yes. edit one file yes. together. Yes. So you have to make the system yourself. What, what uh, There are teams who want um, their engineers to be at office, you know, for core hours. Is there a plugin or something for VS Code? I think there's a plugin. I'll tell you. Okay. Yeah, we'll put that in the show notes. So yeah, a lot of the stuff we're talking about here, open source licensing, 
where the bike trails are. Yeah. We're going to put some <laughs> links in the show notes, which are available on the website for underserved, underserved.libsyn.com, underserved.libsyn.com. So you mentioned uh, cooking and you said sometimes professionally. Tell me a little bit about that. So I probably know all the Indian restaurant owners. They're now my age. So <laughs> in Cambridge and Boston and Arlington and Lexington. And I used to cook. I cook rustic Indian food. I used, uh, sometimes Italian too. Mostly rustic Indian food. And my wife doesn't cook because she's from Russia. She knows spices. But after 15 years... She <laughs> she is um, eating spices, oh, okay. not hot food, but she's eating spices. But I go to restaurants. I still cook on the weekend. I cook every day. So so what? Give me uh, like a signature recipe that you're really good at. So the Indian tandoor, the oven. So I I have to go to a restaurant if I'm cooking for myself because ain't no way at home. So <laughs> other nuns. But I'm mostly into vegetarian now. Not much meat. Mm-hmm. But I make good chicken curry. Mm-hmm. Um, good rustic chicken curry um, and a lot of um, cottage cheese dishes. That's what I do. Um, Have but, you ever been to uh, Masala Art here in Needham? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I like that place. Yes. They're very good. He's there for a long time. He had opened another one in uh, Burlington. He closed it. He sold it then. So um, yeah, Masala Art is there for a long time and he's really good. Mm. But the, the problem um, we are seeing in Indian restaurants and Chinese restaurants the next generation doesn't want to do. There are no chefs. Uh-huh. And the Chinese restaurants, the problem is the chefs don't want to do sushi because it pays more. Mm-hmm. So they are having the same problem too. There are no chefs. Unless you really want to learn and cook yourself. <laughs> so there are interesting things. I cook. Um, my wife eats now spices. And whenever I used to go to St. Petersburg, we alternate one year. India, one year in St. Petersburg. Mm-hmm. Um, no spices there, so I had to go out grocery. Still, after 20 years, 15 years, I go there, no spices. There are no Chinese takeouts, no Chinese restaurants, only one Indian restaurant in the city. There are Turkish restaurants, so you can go and eat Turkish if you really want. I go crazy because they don't eat spices. So <laughs> yeah, I, I like uh, starting in 95 when I hit the professional world, I met a lot of guys from India and they insisted that we get spicy food at Indian restaurants and Thai restaurants. And yeah. I became somewhat addicted. I like a good lamb good. vindaloo. Yeah. I like um, the idli with the like red pepper chutney. Oh, yeah. Now, even in Cambridge, long time, there was no Indian, you know, people were not eating, but now it's like all over. But Russia, in St. Petersburg, nothing. They eat a lot of sushi and meats, but no spices. All right, so if I'm going out for Indian in Cambridge, where should I go? There's none. There are none there. No? No. How about Boston? <laughs> Boston, you can Jamaica Plain. JP? JP. There's the one called Bukhara. Bukhara? Yes. Okay. You can go there. South Boston has Mela. It's okay, but Bukhara is good. All right. Well, my oldest daughter's vegan, so that's one way I can usually get her yes. to go out and get some Indian food. Yes. And I, ha- I knew an Israeli girl. She came here, and she's now in Apple. She's working in Apple. And she was a vegetarian, and she had never eaten Indian food. And I took her to a buffet in Cambridge, and she went, I'm like, yeah, you can eat everything. She was <laughs> I know you're sick of salads. So give this a try. Yeah. <laughs> she inhaled the samosas. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining me today, Arvind. I really appreciated your insights on open source, open bikes, <laughs> open Indian food. <laughs> thank you for having me. It yeah. was fun. <laughs> I look forward to speaking with you again on Underserved. Yeah. Cool. Thank you.